Sessions uh, session. And I'm really excited to have these three people here today and really excited to hear from them. Um, in my mind, these three artists maneuver um, moving in new directions with grace while continuing to share their voice using multimedia. So we're going to go Stephanie, C, and Sal. Stephanie Crossman is a resident of Vinyl Haven Island and is a sculpture artist who specializes in knitting sculptures. Her style is based on the ancient skill of knotting, knitted, knotted knitting, which she has taken into a contemporary end. Her husband's great grandmother, Grand Jay, taught her the technique when she, when Grand Jay was 92 years old. And Stephanie now uses these skills to create original and handmade tiny nets, which are shaped into 3D art. Please welcome Stephanie. I'm going to go up here, I'm going to see the slides. And as you can probably tell, I'm originally from South Carolina, and I've just come back from being home for a while, so if the accent throws you, raise your hand, I'll try to interpret for you. <laughs> I often have to for my husband when we're down there. He's the native. He's out there probably seven generations, and as Lisa said, my husband's great-grandmother is the one that taught me. And I was up visiting him one summer before we got married, and I went over to visit his great-grandmother, and she was sitting in front of, um, did that picture of her come through? Mm -hmm. um, these are the tools that I use. The first set of tools of, are the wooden ones, and that's what I started with. And as I've moved into the sculptural stuff, I started using the smaller stuff, which is, they're all handmade. But, um, next one, see, she's there. That's cream check. She was sitting in front of this little net stand, which looked like a, a mm -hmm. chair that somebody had modified. And through um, talking with another woman over on Stonington who had done research on netting, she said, Vinyl Haven is the only place that these net stands are indigenous. She said, I've seen netting all over the world, but I've never seen them anywhere but Vinyl Haven. So I now own that. It's 135 years old, and her uncle built it for her when she was 12. Mm -hmm. So she, um, she was sitting at that one day, and I went over to visit her, and she, I said, that looks like fun. She goes, you want to learn? And I said, I'd love to. And I said, really, it's a ploy just to get me to come back every afternoon and sit with her. But I'm the one that got the goodies at the end. So I started out with that, and um, she taught me to make a bag that day. At the end of it, you know, I had this little drawstring bag, and a year or so later, after we got married, we moved up here full time. So I've been here for 41 years now. And we um, both worked for a cottage industry for a couple of years, making bags that they processed food in and some for the actual fishing industry. I did a, a dip net that they put on a hoop for deep sea fishing. But that either went offshore, disappeared, they came up with some other way to do this stuff. So I started playing around with the nylon netting and figured out how to dye it and I started coming up with my own pattern. So I ended up making, this was a real utilitarian piece that has an interesting story. Somebody mentioned the Penobscot Marine Museum this morning. Well, I have done demonstrations there and um, somebody had gotten in touch with them and they sent me this interesting email. And it was from a guy in Australia who had a uh, 1930s or 40s DC-3 airplane like Amelia Earhart flew. 
and he was restoring it. And he said, I need somebody to net the luggage racks for me. Mm -hmm. So he ended up dyeing the cotton, because that is cotton. He sent me the original and shipped everything to me. And I made this huge netting piece for his luggage rack. So I told him, I said, when you're done with it, send me pictures. That's, that's about five years ago. I haven't heard from him. So I don't know if it's done or not. But it was a very, very interesting project. But um, after I had tried um, dyeing the nylon, and I did shopping bags, and then I started doing stuff with yarn and linen, you know, all kinds of different fibers. If I could put it on a needle, I'd net with it. That after a while, um, I had done the small pocketbooks, scarves, shawls, ponchos, but when I found that tiny little neat metal needle that you saw at the beginning, it's only about that big and it was handmade, I thought, how small can I go? Somebody must have done something with this at one time, and the only thing I've ever found um, were gloves. And they were made really, really tiny, so I went and got a toothpick and I started netting over a toothpick. I had tatting thread that I've been moving around the house for 30 years. And I finally said, aha, I can get that can out and see what I can do. So I loaded up a needle and I started and that's what really made the transition for me. Um, the shopping bags are the, still the mainstay of that end of things, but I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. Um, thing about the knot, this, this is the same knot that I use in the shopping bag is what I use in the sculptures that you're going to see. It's only the difference in the fiber and the size of the knot. I only know one knot. I know it really well. And that's where knowing your, the properties of your discipline comes in really important. You know, it's, you know what it'll do. After you've handled it, people say, how long does it take you to make a piece? And I'm smart, I'll answer, said 30 years. Because it took me 30 years of netting the utilitarian stuff to get to the part that's the art now. Mm -hmm. And after I knew what it would and would not do, that art part came out. It was, I was obsessed. I couldn't sleep at night. I kept coming up with ideas. Things just kept running through my head. I could, can I do this? Can I do that? Um, the challenge, the biggest challenge for me was nobody else does this. You don't go to art school to learn it. Um, I had nobody to ask questions of. Back when there were old timers on the island that did make utilitarian nets that I might could have asked technique questions of, I didn't have the questions. Mm -hmm. And after they all passed and I gotten this far in, I realized now I've got the questions and I've got nobody to ask. So um, my method is mostly trial and error, but on the good side of that, it frees up my imagination to do and think outside the box. I'm not focused on a particular method that I was taught. So. Um, I also find too that when I, I do a lot of retail shows mostly and I do some gallery representation and uh, this piece in particular was for an exhibition through Surface Design Association. It was about um, the usage of mills in Maine and how they died out and what they used to make and the people that worked there and everything. So this was called the Demise of Hathaway the Shirt Factory. But um, because it's so unusual, I find myself having to educate people at shows. And again, in galleries, if my stuff is in the gallery, unless the gallery people know the story and know the language behind it, people just walk by it because they don't get what it is. So because of... Um, it being so unusual, I usually end up giving them a history lesson and telling them the origins of fish netting and the other things that nets were used for. But because most of the art is nature-based, it brings attention to ecosystems, 
and that I really like because there's so much stuff out there that's dying out and people don't know about it and people consider dandelion weeds and they're really cool plants. But um, a lot of people that end up purchasing pieces I find have some childhood connection. Mm. It speaks to them in a place of innocence, in a place of happiness. Back when they were kids, you know, I didn't put in a slide, but I have a lightning bug in a jar. And I get more giggles off of that from people because they look at it and I've punched holes in the top. I said, well, how else is it going to breathe? But there's glow in the dark thread, so I did glow in the dark body to him. I had a guy came in uh, the gallery and bought um, a Luna Moth. He said, I'm giving it to my son because that was something that he collected as a kid and was really connected to. Sand dollars, who hasn't picked up sand dollars on the beaches? The jellyfish are always fun because people either have a love-hate relationship with them. Either we just love them or no, we don't want anything to do with them. And this is my southern piece because <laughs> for me, shrimp netting, netting's the same everywhere. Third world countries, it's still the same knot. It's just, again, the difference in the fiber and the size of the hole. And that's why I always have shopping bags when I'm doing shows because it gives people something. They can look at the shopping bag and understand that knot so that it helps them to understand the knot they're looking at in the sculptural pieces. But um, things run their course, fashion changes, so I'm kind of phasing out most of the wearable stuff down to the shopping bags because again, they're a good talking point. They're utilitarian, so I still keep my fingers in that, but most of my focus now is on the um, sculptural end. Um, One of the big things, the big difference in the bodies of work is language, too. And I found this one out last year. It, I'm a slow learner, so it took a while to figure this out. I've only been doing the sculptures for about 10 or 11 years. I was doing a show in Florida, and I was getting so frustrated because people come by all the time and go, oh, those are crochets that I'm about ready to make a big sign that says, oh, they're not crochet. But people don't understand. People don't have the knowledge of textile arts anymore, so they they don't know any other language. And they'll read netting and think I'm saying knitting, and I go, no, knitting and crocheting are loops. You can pull those out if you make a mistake. These are all knotted. If you make a mistake, you pick the knot out, no matter how bad, how tiny, how far you have to go. So I said, that's not the, not, not the fun part. But my husband was sitting there and he said, you gotta quit saying netting. And I go, what else am I gonna say? And I looked at one of my other signs. It said, hand knotted. I just did this show in March, again, in Florida. I changed my signs, I changed my language, and people responded differently. Mm -hmm. So I started saying, these are all hand knotted. Mm -hmm. They're knotted by hand. And then I got a lot less of the knitting, crocheting language. Um, so pay attention to that kind of thing when you're looking at making your transition and how is your wording working for you. Um, I am working on new projects. I work a lot. Some things work out, some things end up in the trash because you just don't know how they're going to go. And I wing it. The first time out making a new design, I don't have anything really to go by. I just start. But um, I was somebody was teasing me on the boat the other day. They said, do you net everywhere you go? I said, yeah, I'm a doctor's in the story. I'm net on a boat, on that on a plane, on that on a train, on <laughs> a car. It's so labor intensive that I usually just keep on working wherever I am. And um, I research different things. I watch a lot of videos on underwater life because being along the coast, plus it's netting, it just lends itself really well to doing a lot of aquatic subjects. 
But then I found out, you know, there's a lot of people who are not into the ocean thing. So there's flowers, there's bugs. See, I'm a southern girl, I like bugs. So I sell more bugs to women than anybody else. <laughs> but most of my collectors are men. And I found that interesting because what happened was, um, the first ones I did were all cream on black. And most men are colorblind, at least to some extent. About 40% of them are. And I even had a guy in my booth one day turn around and finish my sentence saying, yeah, we're colorblind. So they see those really well. And because I, I love doing shows because I get that chance to talk to people. And I asked them, I was just telling them, I said, whenever somebody's in my booth and they've been in there for a while, I don't bother them. I just let them look. And then I'll ask them, what's your favorite piece? And then they go, oh. And that makes them really focus on everything in there. And then I'll say, is there any reason? I say, I'm doing my marketing research is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And they just don't know it. But it's always fun to see what people are drawn to. And I asked them, is there anything that I'm not making that you'd be interested in? The spider that you saw earlier, some woman asked me to make her a black widow spider. And I did. I made her black one on white, but I like the cream. And I used really fine um, embroidery thread that's clear plastic to make the web. So you can't really see it unless it hits the light at a certain angle. But all of this came from fish nets, you know? And I said, who knew? 40 something years ago that this was the transition that I would go through to get to this end and it hasn't finished. I'm trying to figure out how to paint landscapes now. How can I net a landscape with netting? I'm looking at abstracts. This one's not abstract. This is actually a piece of rock weed and that's a piece of kelp. I had a woman ask me to make her a piece of bull kelp. And that piece has a piece inside of it. This first piece I did that was multi-layered, so it's really three-dimensional. And that is the big part of this, is trying to figure out how to make them all three-dimensional and get them to stay that way. And I still experiment. I've tried resins. I made a giant puffer fish and I put resin on him and he fell off of what he was sitting on and broke his tail off, so I know that's too brittle. So, back to the drawing board. So every one of them has got a challenge to it that you've got to come up with something new every time, but it keeps your brain working. And uh, it's all experimental, so who knows where it'll go, where it'll end, but um, it's been a fun journey. And we'll see what happens next. Thank you guys. Thank you. Seam <laughs> Vanderbilt is a ceramic artist who resides in Lincolnville. His work is inspired by the ideas of home, family, and our relationships to nature. Seam's award-winning work is recognized the intricate pattern and texture on his ceramic pieces. Along with his studio work, Seam has taught at the collegiate level for many years and has been a resident artist at several notable art retreats. And for many mid-coast artists, he may have even been their high school art teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so glad to have you here, Seam. So, we're going to give it a draw. Hi, everyone. Hi. So I do have, I have a, a plan here, um, but the way it works in the studio is I have a plan, I face a direction, and then questions come up and I change directions, see where I end up. So you may not want to do it. Oh, it's going already. Okay, so we're, we're on a roll. Um, but it's okay. We're going to go with that. Um, if you have a question while I'm speaking, go ahead. See if I say something that needs unpacking. I do have some things going. I'm honored to have been asked to be here. Thank you. Lisa. When people come into my studio or gallery and ask, how long did that take to make? I usually answer with my age, 62 years. And if I'm feeling a little more expansive, I answer with a question. What do I get to include? 
When I was six, my family started going to Wingersheet Beach outside of Gloucester, Massachusetts for summer vacation. We'd pack up the car with the camping gear and head due east from our suburban home outside of Syracuse, New York. My parents were in the front, my two older brothers in the middle seat, and me stuck way in the back. The first years nestled in that little storage area behind the back seat of our Volkswagen Beetle. Um, later on, I was in the back among all the luggage and equipment, the camping stuff, in the back of our 65 Volvo wagon. I remember staring out the window at the edge of the road. I remember my excitement peaking as the soil along the edge of the tarmac switched to sand. We stayed at a campground near the beach, Wingersheet Beach. Most days, we'd head to the beach right after breakfast. And I'd spend the day exploring the tide pools, gathering rocks, and pieces of driftwood to bring home and paint. When I was eight, I remember saving my chore money for a mask and snorkel set to use at the beach. And I spent innumerable hours face down, getting lots of sunburns, just floating in those tide pools. And I remember so clearly learning that if I just hung there and kept watching, whole world, a world of barnacles, crabs, snails, minuscule fish, and creatures I had no name for, they'd reveal themselves to me. There were hundreds of people all around me playing, running, splashing, and sunning on that beach. And here I was with my own secret world laid out before me. On the way back to upstate New York, I would stare out the car window and watch the sand change back to soil, and my heart would sink. Even though we were heading home, I felt like I was leaving it. So that's why I live in Penobscot, where I live now. Mr. Parker was my high school photography teacher. He probably wouldn't have called himself an artist, but he did have a successful commercial photography business, and he, and he taught. Mr. Parker taught through precise demonstration. We could ask questions, but mostly we stood silently watching him work, and then we were let go to try it ourselves. Back then, we were working with manual cameras, black and white film, and chemicals, and I loved every bit of it. My bus stop was a half mile from my house. One day, well into the semester in photography, on my way home, I noticed a section of roof had blown off an abandoned barn. That image stopped me in my tracks. I still, I can still picture it so clearly right now. And I realized that something inside me had changed. I didn't see the hole or the underlying rafters or the purlins. What I saw was pattern. I saw, where was I saw, I saw abrupt changes of value creating a particular strength of contrast. And I didn't have my camera on me, but I was seen through it. My body, for the moment, had become the camera. And the camera, I realized, had been become a tool for me to reach outside of myself. So I ran home as fast as I could, knowing that there was nothing that was going to get in the way of me grabbing that camera and getting back to that site. I'm convinced there's very little in my life that isn't included in all that I make. So a super quick biography. I was born in Syracuse, New York to immigrant parents. Two older brothers did poorly in high school because I spent most of my time in the art room or dark room. But I managed to get into college and I graduated with a printmaking degree, a minor in sculpture, and art certification. After college, I worked on schooners and yachts, worked as a goldsmith, a contractor, and then taught art for 20 years. While teaching, I started working with clay studied painting and critical theory and earned an MFA with a concentration in ceramic and drawing. That was quick. All right. So when do you want to go to Cups? What's that? you want to go to Cups now? Well, no, I still have a little bit more. Okay. Are we still going? We're still yeah. going. So this, so I have four groupings of, this is, that was perfect timing. Perfect timing. Okay. I have four groupings of images set up. The first is a sort of what you've been looking at now is a sort of introductory overview of what I do. The second is, cups and bowls. The third shows the different ways I use a particular motif. 
and the fourth is the most recent body of work. Still with me at all? Good. I make art as a way of exploring, as a way to understand the world around me, as a way to make or deepen connections. Materials, each with their own language and lessons, tools with their built-in capabilities and limitations, and processes with their finicky demands are the means by which I travel. Oh, that's the end right there? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Let's stop. Can we hold that for a second? Yeah. Great. Okay. We can go to can we go to the first cup or is that on a timer? It's gonna time. <coughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> so oh, and I just have to finish this paragraph. And then we're doing pretty well. So um, back to uh, processes with their finicky demands. They are all means by which I travel. And when it's going right, I get lost. And when I find my way back, and I'm very, very lucky, I've made something that allows others to see the world around them in a new way, or to make or deepen their connections to it. All right. Now on to cups. I'm going to start with a, a poem that I, I don't know if it's a poem, just something I wrote about cups that just keeps coming back to me. A beautiful handmade cup is a three-line poem about cup consideration. The foot speaks about a relationship to its ground, about stability, and how it will lift. The body of the cup talks about a relationship to your hand about separation and containment, about the definition of inside and outside. Mm -hmm. And the rim offers wisdom in its relationship to your lips, offering and delivering warmth, refreshment, stimulation, and redemption to your body. I'm gonna read that again. Mm -hmm. A beautiful handmade cup is a three-line poem about consideration. The foot speaks about a relationship to its ground, about stability, and how it will lift. The body of the cup talks about a relationship to your hand, about separation and containment, about the definition of inside and outside. And the rim offers wisdom in its relationship to your lips, offering and delivering warmth, refreshment, stimulation, and redemption to your body. I sometimes think of my studio practice as a tree. Its roots are down in the ground, down in the muck, down in the, the dirt, the shit, and all that kind of stuff. And those roots reach in all directions, drawing life from what lies below the surface, past and present, and it feeds the trunk of the tree. The trunk of the tree in my studio practice, made of cups. That's, that's, that's the base of it. And, and, and sometimes, I mean, I, I go back and forth whether this is true or not, but I say it anyway, that if I, were, if I were a brave enough artist, all I would do is make cups. But I'm just not that brave, and I'm also easily distracted. <laughs> But cups are very much at the center of what I do. Um, cups do everything that I want all of my artwork to do. I don't know if that makes any sense whatsoever, but cups do what I want all of my artwork to do. Whether it's a painting, whether it's a sculpture, whether it's a piece of furniture, doesn't matter. I'm, it, my cups tend to accomplish what I want them to do, which is I want them to hold and deliver warmth and nourishment. Hard to make a painting do that. I hope that my better painting is now. I want everything that I make to ask for attention through multiple senses. And I want everything that I make, and my cups seem to do it, to allow for moments of reflection and connection. I'm convinced that I do not wish peace for the world. I am convinced that I do not actually wish. Let's just, let's just stick with that motif, for that understanding, that, that I think that would, you know, peace for everyone would be horrible. Moments of peace. That will redeem the world. Moments of beauty. 
if we're constantly bombarded by beauty, if we're constantly bombarded with light, if we're constantly bombarded by everything that's good, we will die. It's reaching for those moments, finding the moments of it. And I think that a cup can deliver that. It's held in the hand, that moment of stopping, reflecting, and all that. Um, and I, and I work, and, and the cups artistically, sort of functionally, are, oh, that's the last one. Um, they, as an artist, I can explore uh, proportion, color, texture, you know, uh, over and over. And I can make, you know, 15 of what I think of the same form, and that one will be better. Like, how does that happen? It's amazing, you know, and that, that nuance. And, and it's not like, you know, I think sometimes the filmmakers, oh my god. How do you do like 10 films and say, oh, that's the one I really should be making. Oh, my life's done, too, so I'm, I'm done now. But you know, cups, you can do that. I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Now on to eggs. So, so eggs, so the, the, the cups kind of are the center of that. Eggs are, if I think of my, the practice of my, is this, do I click on this one? No, oh, this one's not good. Um, um, oh no, it's gone. I, or did I click that? Um, so this is a way. Yeah. So I have this series of slides um, as a way of showing instead of going instead of having the sort of one particular material, I use eggs as a motif. So eggs. I think everybody has a relationship to eggs one way or the other. And I don't, you know, I, I'm not trying to convince anybody of a particular relationship to eggs, just that they do. And so they're going to look, oh, this is just going to go on its own. It's great. Um, and so I make, th like that is, that's about five and a half years of making little porcelain handmade eggs. Um, you know, I can make, like, each one takes about 20 minutes to a half hour to make, and I've sort of been um, firing groups of them over, over the years. Um, that's egg and bronze. And so the egg motif just keeps on coming. And I love it because eggs to me contain that paradox that is our very nature. That they are incredibly fragile but are protective. They only serve their purpose when they're broken. Um, they are homes, they're vessels, they do that inside and outside thing. They have all that kind of stuff. That's actually two eggs taken apart, put back together in multiple layers inside. That was a very complicated, but it's only a little sculpture. But it's, just a, it's a great piece, and it was bought by a, a sculptor that I really, really, really admire. It was fun. Um, eggs just, they just keep on drawing me on. I make little tiny ones, I make big ones, I, I put them in things. This is from a series called the Home Series, and it's reflections on home. And those pieces are fired in the wood box of a big wood kiln. They go through absolute hell but they still have this little thing nestled. And, and to me, home is about protection, about vulnerability, about all sorts of different things. You know, the world goes on and gets destroyed and rebuilt around us, and we, we you know, find our home, you know, sometimes by ourselves, sometimes among others, and it's just a great sort of motif. And the egg stands in as that person, or, you know, in so many other, other ways. Um, eggs are a great stand-in, and they're just great objects on their own. And they have that same thing for me, that you can make this form, and that, oh, that's a really good egg. Like, what do you mean what's a really good egg? That's ridiculous to have that kind of a, you know, that proportion is better than another one. And, but it, it does work. There are some that are just, like, real eggy, and others <laughs> aren't. Um, um, I mean, if you've ever gotten a chance to see, like, someone's collection of eggs, it's really fascinating to think about these things that have were formed inside and come out and do all these things like that. And sometimes you get little pieces of furniture stuck in there with the eggs. <laughs> there. Those things are about that big, like the whole sculpture is about that big. It's a little scale. Um, are the eggs hollow? The eggs are hollow, yeah, they're always hollow. That's about 22 inches tall. So that's a, that's a big egg. And I've, so I've been making a series of these. Um, sort of garden. It can be inside. It can be outside. This that that actually was outside in my garden for a number of years until the oak branch fell out. Now all the stuff that was stuck inside can get out now. Um, um, 
I have another one in my garden that I actually put hay inside and inoculated it with mushrooms. And mushrooms, you know, kind of grew out of them. It's really kind of fun, um, that kind of thing. And um, so eggs, eggs, and I'm, you know, and I'm not gonna, like, I will, I will work on a form. I will kind of reproduce a form, not reproduce, but kind of explore that form until I stop learning from it. Mm. And I don't, I cannot imagine that I will ever stop learning from eggs. Mm. Um, and that again, that's also about two feet tall. 16 inches wide. And I just did a, a project with uh, Farnsworth, where I worked with eighth graders, where I made one of these eggs, and then the students cut it up, um, or had the age, and they each took a section to a self-portrait on that, and now we're sewing that back together. And that's going to be a fun piece. Um, and that's also one of those big ones. Uh, even, the, even the smallest ones are hung up? Even the smallest ones? I have ones that are that big that are hung up. Yeah. What's that? How do you do that? With really small old tools. I do it. It's essentially, I'm making a little pinch pot. I think that's the last one. Yeah, it's essentially a little tiny, tiny, tiny pinch pot. Yeah. The next, the next one is the last one. And this one is. Okay, great. Great. That's fantastic. Good. I came to Maine one, two days after graduating from college to work on scooters. Mm -hmm. Upstate New York. Um, I had sailed all my life, but um, and I had spent some time. Oh, it's still clicking through. It's all right. We're going to go back to that one, but I can go back, which is good. Um, and uh, I, fr I got here. I was going to be cook on the mistress, and um, but the owner of the, the, the fleet asked me to with a, a group with a, a captain and a group to go up to Billings Yard in Stonington, Maine, um, uh, uh, on Deer Isle to do fitting up. And just imagine this kid coming from upstate New York, on the, you know, I was on the Canadian border, um, you know, and here I am on foggy Penobscot Bay in May, and it was just, I, you know, I was home. I did that, that feeling that I talked about, uh, you know, go, going to the beach and kind of coming back and just being sad, I knew I was home. The, the yard, um, we couldn't work on the boat during certain hours because it was a union yard. And so I got to walk along the beach, which I realized, you know, I didn't realize. I just did automatically. That's just what I did. And I found this piece of, tin, of, of copper. Does anybody recognize what it is? Anybody recognize what that is? It's not one of those things that magnetizes metal to it. What's it called? No, no, no it's, it's, it's only about this big. It's about that. It's a patch. It's a copper boat patch. Mm -hmm. And it was just on the ground. It's it was on the, water on, line. It was on the beach. And that's on the water line. That's bottom tape. So, um, so whoa, whoa. <laughs> um, are, could you? I'm just wondering if you could rate the speech. Rate, 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 rate an emoji. Thing, put it down in your survey. And, how, that's amazing. Anybody have that with the new iPhones? They'll do. they like, I have this iPhone 14. And it's like, it'll just do stuff. <laughs> It'll record entire conversations and like, oh, I don't want that. I'll try to erase it. And, Oop, there it goes. <laughs> oh my God, you don't want a colonoscopy? Um, anyway. Um, so anyway, I found this boat patch and it was just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And I've kept it with me, um, you know, since 1982. Um, I was 21 years old and it was, and it's, it's copper. The holes in it are, um, from from the the you know the copper knit brads that would have held it in place and the color on it is from anti fouling paint. All right, fast forward to um, a long time later. I'm out on Matinicus Island with a, a former student um, and fr who's become a good friend and a colleague, and he's curating he's cur curating a show at CMCA, and um, I'm out there on Matinicus Island helping him. Good, just going to run, helping him. Um, Find, find stuff for this show called Gleanings. And I come across the what's called the bridge in a lobster trap. And the bridge is, is, are those square sort of supported pieces that are on the corner and across like that. But these are, these are these wrecks. And what has happened is lobster traps get lost. They get either cut or they're on the bottom of the ocean. They fish for a while on their own and then they start coming apart and they come back up on the, on the beach. Freaking unbelievable! I think about like what those pieces of material have have seen. Anyway, I then did a I started building, started the ones that were going. If we go back, um, started building buildings, making little buildings, welding them together, 
and then I sort of built this whole city um, of, of, of these buildings. I, you know, I don't know how many I had of them. And um, sort of arranging them in blocks and having streets in between like that. It was just it was this fun project that kind of didn't go anywhere. Um, I still have a few of them. Um, but then I then I um, did uh, take photograph them, and then I used this is actually a f uh, poster that's about 36 by 40, not a poster, but a poster size. Um, I would photograph, and this is a track weight. This is a brick covered with barnacles that ended up back up on the beach. I mean, how does that happen? You know, that was, I just, I love, I just love that. And, and anyway, um, I, I, I photographed it, separated it, and then I did silk screens on top of it. And then, and then I started getting interested in just pieces of, of the traps. Um, and working with, um, and, and you can see in this one that actually there are pieces um, that I leave in the, in, the, in the composition. And then there's others that I'm just doing the impression. And I'm, sort of use them as this, this motif. Um, and the reason I, in this talk, um, use this, uh, or, or bring this to you, is because you can see I work in lots of different areas. But that, that idea, and we kind of have this idea, there, there are two themes, I think, in my talk today. One is about um, that the work we made in, involves, I'm, I'm, you know, maybe it's because I'm Dutch, that I, you know, I don't want to waste anything. And there isn't anything from my life that I want to like not have contributing to what I do. Um, and this work more than any kind of brings that together. And I love the ceramics. I use clay because there's there's clay as a as a material itself has no there's nothing. I mean, it always has something to teach. It always smacks me right upside the head and said, "Look, you're just part of something bigger." But this work I love because it involves the print. I was a printmaking major. I use an intaglio press to make the impressions using the lobster trap pieces. It has um, silver and gold leaf, you know, which is going back to my, my goldsmithing days. It has painting. I studied. I you know I went into college as a painting major. Came out as a printmaking major. I studied painting in France and critical theory. It has that in there. It has it has color theory. Um, it has. You know, I, I layer uh, paint and I build paint the way I layer and build glaze on stuff. It just pulls all this stuff together. But most importantly, is I kind of start with a con This is a great piece. We can stop on. Um, well, anyway, um, this. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll put down a ground. I'll choose a piece. I'll I'll, I'll I'll kind of figure out a composition. I'll run it through the press. I start building up paint. Um, and sometimes I know, like I know the move I have to make. Like, oh, I'll mask this, you know, I'll mask this out, I'll leave it yellow, and I'll put another color over it. And I kind of build it, and, and sometimes I guess I don't know what move I have to make, and I often work in series. I don't know where they're going. And I just kind of make a move, and then go on, do another one. This one I kept on like coming back to, like, I don't know what to do. And I'd go on, I'd work on it, and i come back, come back, I just don't know what to do. And I work on other. And I realized the reason I didn't know what to do is because it was done. Yeah. Like, I had no idea. It, it, you know, like I hadn't made enough moves in my head. So that process of getting lost and then finding your way and realizing it is, I just love this work for that. That's my talk. Go ahead. Is that question. On a ceramic base, or is that? No, it's it's on. It's actually on extruded urethane. It's on the same material um, that. Uh, Lobster uh, uh, pot markers are made from. Hmm. It's, it's urethane. It's, but the good thing is it's archival. It's um, and I and I found it, found that this is sort of the, one of the last major pieces I made. Um, um, so these pieces. So it's a it's an extruded urethane board, and it was it was developed for the CNC industry. You know, um, CNC computer computer. Oh. Okay, um, it's it's it, they're they're three D cutters okay. and they're used in industry. And if you're making something that's being cut, you know, like you've sort of designed an engine part, let's say, and you want to test out if your program is working, um, you don't want to ruin your tool testing it on the the aluminum that the block is going to made out. So what they do is they make a block of this material that I'm using because it doesn't use it's really evenly grained and it doesn't use up the tools. Well, I got to it because it takes a perfect impression, and you can buy it in different densities. 
um, and um, and it works for, for what I'm trying to do. I was originally trying to do it in wood, and it just didn't work. And then um, you can paint on it. And then it, yeah. Do you have to prime it with it? I do. I put primer on it, but I don't know if I have to because it's urethane. Is it? Is it acrylic paint or oil? What's that? It's acrylic. It's actually acrylic, graphic, uh, graphite, spray paint. I kind of do whatever it takes. Um, it has no, I mean, I've seen some of these in real life, and they have no look of plasticity at all. So I was just like, what? I, I never knew what the yeah. support was, so that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. That's great stuff. Um, what's that? Where do you get I can talk to you later. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. I can give you that. Thank you. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Based photographer, photographic artist and writer Sal Taylor Kidd uses various photographic media and a personal narrative that explores themes around memory and belonging, combining her poetry with alternative processes of photography and object making. Along with her photography, she has published several books and is a veteran workshop leader and educator. Welcome, Sal. And you can use the arrow to Great. Um, I, I apologize if you can't hear me, just, I'm just getting over a bit of a cold here. But um, thank you, Lisa. Um, it's such a, such a thrill to be here and to be able to talk about my work. I think sometimes as artists, we, you know, I'm so inspired listening to everybody, um, the other speakers here, because I think sometimes we get so excited in our media and we, you know, gallerists and curators, they kind of like to somewhat have you stay in your lane a little bit. And they're like, oh, you're doing this now. And I think we really need to embrace that. And I'll be talking a lot about my journey through experimenting with different media and also how I've managed to kind of stay consistent within that. And that I think if you trust yourself, then you realize that you know, you're know you always telling your story no matter what media you, you end up um, exploring and so there's a real comfort in that that you can sort of be free to experiment knowing that you're always coming back to your to your familiar themes and your your motifs and your tropes and it was something i was a little nervous of at, at, at first and I've, I've learned to embrace it so um you know i've been a you know full-time photographer now for about uh, 15 years i started off with a very sort of corporate background um, I worked in the dot-com industry for a while, um, and it's interesting, you know, I have teenage kids now, and they're sort of like, no, oh, there's all this pressure of what am I going to do with my life, and I'm like, just think about what you want to do first, because life is long, and, you know, I think it applies as well to our journey as artists, is that, you know, you might start off as a painter and then move into, you know, ceramics or printmaking, but, you know, if you can embrace the, the journey that the process kind of leads you to, um, I think you you end up having a very rich life. Anyway, so I started off photographing my children, and I became very interested in um, the, the sort of the ideals of childhood. At the time, we were living in Los Angeles, and we spent a lot of time on Deer Isle, which is where my husband's family are from. So every summer, you know, my kids would be in this, in this you know, their day-to-day -day lives were quite prescribed, you know, sort of city environment. And then in the summer, especially when they were little, they got to be these kind of wild things. And I was really fascinated by that. It really spoke to my childhood, you know, 70s kid, really, you know, here's the key, come back at sunset. Um, and I loved seeing them sort of exploring the natural world and interacting with it. And I began to see all these sort of, um, you know, parallels between their sort of becoming, their evolving, and the creatures of the ponds, and you know, watching the sort of the the life cycle of the tadpoles and pollywogs, you know, sort of going through, um, becoming frogs, and you know, my kids were sort of slipping in and out of the, the water, and and it really spoke to me, and it sort of so the time I was um, studying a main media, I kind of knew that at some point we would be moving here. Um, or moving back to Maine anyway. And I wanted to build a community <coughs> here for myself. My husband already had his community. And I thought, if I'm gonna be here, I wanna find my people. And I hadn't really found that in my previous in my previous job. And also, I hadn't really found a community of artists in LA. The LA 
landscape, you know, you can imagine if this is the kind of work I'm making, you know, it's very personal, intimate, you know, it's all about the natural world. Los Angeles really didn't feel like a great fit for me. Um, and so I would come to Maine and I would make all this work and then I'd go back to LA and, you know, I would print and do other things, but I wasn't so inspired by, you know, the, the, the environment I was in. And someone gave me some great advice early on and they said, you know, really figure out what inspires you and where you've come alive as an artist and go there and find time to be there. And it served me really, really well in my life. Um, I try, you know, a lot of being a photographer specifically is about noticing what you notice. You know, being intentional about what you're responding to in the world and understanding that. Um, and that's sort of how my, my practice evolved to, um, to start to include writing and poetry because the writing really helped me understand what I was doing with the photography. So I always think about photography as my way of sort of receiving and responding to the world. And then the writing is the vehicle whereby I kind of distill and examine that experience, try and understand it. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's really important to, to document your process, you know, and, and the writing for me in some ways, even though it's its own process, is also a part of documenting my process. Because it all comes to being, you know, circling around this idea of understanding what I'm doing, you know, who am I as an artist, what am I trying to say, what are the themes I'm exploring, and, you know, I, I work a lot with students and, and mentor a bunch of folks, and I'm always sort of, you know, pulling them back to, even if they're like, oh, I don't really know what I want to photograph, I just go out and, you know, take pictures, and I'm like, yeah, but when you come back to the studio and you're looking at your work on your computer or in the dark room, or, you know, however you make your work, you make you're making intentional decisions. You know, which which photograph is going to sit with which other photograph, or what is the narrative you're trying to tell? And from that point, you know, you're writing your project statement and really helping your audience understand what your work is about. So I think it it sort of applies to any medium. You know, really kind of taking the time to articulate, you know, what are the processes that you use in your work? Why do you use those processes? How does the form relate to the content of your work? You know, because it all speaks to, you know, whether you're using, you know, like fine threads in your work. There's a, there's a fragility there, right? There's a sort of, you know, makes me think about the fragility of ecosystems that, that we were talking about earlier. You know, and you see that, that sort of synthesis or symbiosis between form and content. Um, so then, you know, I sort of was very interested in photography, taking a lot of photographs of my kids and the natural world. And, you know, I soon realized that the digital life of the photograph was not so interesting to me. It's sort of part and parcel of what I do. I shoot with a digital camera. But ultimately, I'm really interested in memory. And so for me, creating something lasting and enduring is really integral to my practice. So this is sort of, you see this evolution, and sometimes I think as artists, we don't really know where we're going. You know, I love what you were saying, and I made a note, you know, when it's going right, you get lost, which I love that, because that's continually happening with me in my studio. Um, so I really responded to that. But, you know, so I started looking at alternative processes of photography, whereby, you know, you can take a digital print and make, you know, you actually print a negative on a piece of acetate and then you're using these um, early 19th century processes to, um, to sort of make that photograph, you know, coating in a, pa a piece of paper with platinum, palladium emulsion, and then really like making a photograph. And so that, you know, it's always been, I, I love being in the darkroom, I really love making this work. Um, but again, you know, photography, photographers were big fans of the rules, you know, like, you're going to do a series, it's going to be 8 by 10, and there's this number in the edition, and, you know, this is the game of, of working with galleries, right? They want to create scarcity with your work, so it's, it's more expensive. But as an artist, you know, there's a, for me, there's a, there became sort of a repetition in that, that I really, it was not as interesting to me, you know? I, I like to make things and then just have them exist in the world and, and leave the world, which, you know, makes more sense later on. 
Um, so this body of work here was called Origins, and this was sort of all about this, this idea of metamorphosis and watching the metamorphosis of my children and their childhood, but also what was happening in the natural world. And this ended up being um, the first book that I made. You know, I'm a, a big, um, I love books. They, they really speak to me, um, but also they, they're sort of a really um, ideal vehicle for my work. My work is not loud, it doesn't shout. It's like a quiet conversation with my viewer or with my audience. And so that book is like the ultimate one-on-one -on -one relationship. Again, thinking about form and content, what is an ideal form for the work? And I wanted to create that relationship between my work and my, and my reader or my viewer and for them to have that opportunity to sit with the work and, um, and enjoy it at their own pace. And also it's sort of like this wonderful moment where you get to create something and you have total control. You know, these were, my early books have been self-published books, so I do a small run, I can distribute them easily. It's a wonderful, you know, I break even, that's, that's a good day. Um, but you know the writing and the and the photography as well is that wonderful kind of conversation that starts to happen, and you're getting something new. So you know you have the art form of the, the photographs themselves, and then the poetry, and then the book is something else. So again, you know when you're talking about working different media and creating different products, you know from a sort of the business side that no one really likes. You know we all like to think we're doing this just for the love of art, but you know we all well most of us, some of us have to make a living or try to make a living. Um, and so to create things at different price points, you know, maybe someone comes to my show and they can't afford a platinum palladium print, but there's a book there and they feel they can, you know, you know, have a piece of my work and it creates a relationship with that person and then maybe five years down the road, you know, they're ready to, to buy a print or something. So it's it's a nice way of sort of getting my work out there and um, you know, in some ways it's a marketing vehicle too, right? It's a way of, um, of sharing the work. Um, so also, you know, because I love making things, um, handmade books became a real and important part of my practice for a while. Um, so this book was called Keepsakes. Um, it's a series of um, folios in a handmade case. There's letter press in here, um, platinum palladium printing, um, and then digital printing and then the book arts itself. And I think, you know, I did this for um, a few years and I, you know, I enjoy the process, but again, we are making an edition of 15 and so there's that, it gets a little repetitive at, at, at times. And I think I started, when I was doing the letterpress, I was sort of like, okay, you don't have to do everything yourself, you know? What, what can you, what do you really love doing? What really serves your work? And what really is, is you know, perhaps better for a book arts, someone who they are, you know, they are a book artist, full time, that's what they do. And so now I, I work with book artists to make my books. You know, I prefer to focus on the photography and the writing. Um, but, but having gone through that process, I would say my understanding of the media, you know, I know the stitches, I know the bindings, I know how to put an artist book together. And so that appreciation really helps in those conversations with the book artists because I have, you know, they bring ideas, of course, about the possibilities, but I kind of understand the language that they're using. And then this was a book, um, Landfall, that I did in collaboration with a publisher in Korea. Um, again, a limited edition um, run. Um, and this was um, exploring the islands, you know, the Columbus Scott Bay here, the islands there. I was really interested in this idea of these sort of um, potted histories that you find on the islands. You know, so many of them have gone through this real boom and bust, and so there's such a rich history of the communities that live there that are no longer there and no longer thriving. You know, different communities are thriving, but again, I was interested in what those places felt like in the off season, you know, when the tourists have gone home. You know, what, what remains, what endures, you know, what's, what's special there. Um, and then this is um, my most recent book, Yesterday, and this was, uh, again, another limited edition um, book. And this was sort of shot during the pandemic, you know, we were staying on Deer Isle for a lot of that time, especially the summer of 2020. And it was really a very surreal time because we felt that 
you know, like there's this crazy, crazy disease sort of ravaging the world, and we felt sort of normal in this little bubble. It was before the you know the pandemic had really sunk its teeth into into Maine, if you will. And so I sort of had this surreal feeling, and um, the the girl that I was working with, who was my model, was you know getting ready to go to college, and so no idea if she could go, how she could go, how that was, and I was sort of really struck by this sort of burgeoning, of, you know, sort of excitement of someone ready to launch into the world, but kind of not able to do so, and the, the sort of conflict that was arising there. So it's sort of, you know, it's a very, um, a very special project. And then, of course, because we're constantly experimenting and constantly playing, um, I started, this is me in my studio with my, with my press, and I started doing uh, photopolymer gravures, and that's a process where you create a plate from the photograph, and then you're running it through a press with inks. And again, it's this sort of, you know, how can I sort of hand make something um, using my photography? And, you know, uh, again, sort of another little anecdote. Early on in my career, I was, I was working with this woman who was um, a little bit older than me at the time. She was in her mid-60s. And as she was, you know, she was like, holding workshops, she was like traveling for shows, and she was doing all these things, and I was like 30 at the time. And she had this like really vibrant, full, creative life. And I think it was that, even more than the media, in some ways, that I was really drawn to, because I was like, I want something that I can do forever. I never want to retire, I never want to stop. I want to stay as sort of vibrant and and engaged and sort of intellectually curious and, and driven for as long as I possibly can. And she was so inspiring to me, and I, I always talk about her, her name's Connie and Bowden. But you know, I remember having, it was like we were doing a FaceTime, it was before Zoom, I was just like, oh my God, like, look, at, look at her life, look at how she's living, you know, it was, it was really inspiring. And so that's, she's, she's my kind of touch point when I think about this. So this was, um, this show was the first exhibition of the landfall work that you saw in the previous book. And this was part of the CMCA um, biennial. And I worked in collaboration with another artist. And I really started, you know, who did that beautiful screen that you see there? Um, yeah, on the scar. And then the, the painting, or the sort of the photographs, I was really experimenting with frames and vintage frames and you know, creating these sort of one-off pieces that each existed as a single, um, single um, edition of that particular photograph was created as a unique one-off piece. And it was a way for me to sort of start dipping my toes into object making, right? Taking these photographs and thinking about the vessels, you know, like what could I put, you know, what could be a frame? And so initially it was like thinking more conventionally about frames, but getting more interested in this idea of installation, you know, how does the work interact with the space? What other things can I bring to kind of create that experience? Um, this is the first time where I integrated my poems into the installation, so this is one of my poems that we wrote on the wall. Um, but really kind of frame myself up and thinking, how can I use, and you know, it's all telling the st same story, whether I'm writing or photographing or creating these objects it's all about memory it's all about you know trying to preserve what is impossible to preserve really which is kind of the basis of photography right we're trying to fix moments in time and you know however futile that might be so i started getting more and more like i said the, the frames are sort of getting more interesting and more nay and then realizing that all these other sort of um, apertures that i can use to put photographs in um, from old clocks to vintage lockets to, you know, the old frames that you see here. But like taking things apart, and repainting them and um, repurposing them. And then this is kind of the sort of work I'm doing most recently. So, you know, again, sort of the ultimate expression of really repurposing. And these are, you know, I almost see as sort of um, mini codices, you know, they're sort of they're little books in of themselves, these little tins with secrets and um, stories. And it's using my own, you know, my own writing and um, my own photography or found photography sometimes to create these one-off um, pieces. And that's it, thank you.
But it got me thinking. Oh. What did it get you thinking? What? Oh, God. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about um, education in general is mining. Education is mining. You got this big mountain, this big pile in front of you. And you've got to dig through. You know, everybody wants to just have you know, just get the gold nuggets. You know, can you just give me the gold nuggets? Forget about all the, you know, so you have to wade through 20 <coughs> minutes of me gabbing on. But was there any piece of ore? Oh, kind of yeah. ore our own, you know, for this whole hour. I mean, we've been at this for over about an hour. You know, and it's like that, that little piece of ore. And I often think, like, you're still not done. Now you have the ore. Now you have to do, now you have to refine it and do something with it. And I always love that, you know, and because and I've I taught for years, I had students that would come back and say, you remember when you said, I like, oh, no idea. Yeah. I said that? Wow. <laughs> I don't think I was high. Um, but it was, you know, but like those, those little nuggets of ore. It was interesting to me that you all touched on, um, you know, a really, really strong connection to, well, either my boyfriend was in Stoning Town, I've been there for 17 years. Back so it was interesting that he's place. always at Billings, and anyway, yeah. and so it was interesting to me how we were all, and he does Nets heads, and we talked about that, but anyway. Um, interesting themes. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, oh god, there's all this like, you know, Deer Isle, Stonington Ocean, knitting heads, whatever. <laughs> that was just interesting, but also a lot of poetry <laughs> coming yeah. out of that, a lot of writing, and I used to teach English, and I was a dance teacher, and I was a visual artist. So thinking about more, I mean, I do write poems that are on the backs of the cards, the paintings that I make, but it made me think more about more directly incorporating um, in a more overt way mm -hmm. my relationship to writing and my relationship to dance and how that informs my thinking on silk and why it is on block printing because I want to recycle and I do it all these other you know, cycle printing and how, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out how the silk and the block printing go together, but but all of this gave me a lot of ideas and questions and things I wanted to explore. So it was really rich for me in terms of exploring different themes. And it, it made me ask myself questions. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. For me, I wrote down, you know, I'm interested in the tangible and exploring the mediums and thinking, how do I find, how do I know what those new unique mediums are? And so for each of you, what was interesting to me was sometimes it's a chance encounter, sometimes it's a deliberate thing, but what matters is paying attention mm -hmm. and noticing and um, being curious about the collision of something. And mm -hmm. so it's both a process of noticing what lights me up, noticing what's in front of me, and how it relates to what it is I want to say. So that, I also love the utilitarian aspect that, you know, that the cup has this, a purpose. Um, oh, they're all about vessels too, all three of you. So it was interesting oh, to see, you know, yeah, yeah, the yeah. holding of yeah. things. Um, and I think there's a piece of giving yourself permission, right? We all have these voices that say, oh, what's that? No. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Can't do that. Right, you just right. Hear, this is the day we're doing this or what, what not. Yeah. And it's like, okay, let's explore that unknown space, that mountain, and see what else yeah. is available. And I think as well, like, it, it's, the, it's so important, and, you know, thankfully, the pandemic is behind us, well, behind ish. Um, but, like, getting out is really, really important, like, getting out of your studio. We all have, you know, we're all sort of kind of solitary beings in, in a way, but. You know, I just find, you know, of course I'm on Instagram all the time and find inspiration there, but but that's in kind of this very, I don't know, sort of toxic kind of relationship. I don't know. I always have this lovely relationship. It's like, I've got to be there. I've got to be there. But I think, you know, every time I go to a show or, you know, looking at someone else's work or... And even sort of, you know, there was a whole... I was in New York last week and there was this whole exhibition about... AI at MoMA, and I got so much out of it. I have no interest in, in, in AI photography, apart from sort of I'm curious about it and I want to understand it. I, I don't think I could imagine using it in my practice, but again, never say never. But sort of intellectually, it's sort of like, it's, it's a, something of our times, right? It's so important to, to kind of understand the cultural context we live in. And I got so much out of like, there were at least two or 
three photographers doing really interesting work in that exhibition. And even, you know, I saw, just quickly, I saw something on Instagram, I was like, which is like most people walk around um, galleries, right? And they stand back and they look at the work. And they said, you look at how an artist goes around a gallery and they're like peering in and like taking a photograph and framing and like trying to see how it's done. And that's for sure me. And I always am inspired by other people's work and approaches and just like, oh my God, I never thought that that was possible. So I think that's, that can be really helpful. Well, I did the same thing. I did a show in Rochester, New York last November, and I said, we are so close to the Corning Museum. And somebody told me about the Blaschka's glass jellyfish and their anemones and all of this. And I don't have any interest in glass, but the subject matter and the detail that they used in making that stuff was mind-boggling. So again, the inspiration comes from looking at other people's work. And theirs was for scientific purposes, not even artistic, and it was really a mind-blowing experience to go there and see all of that. Yeah. Yeah, we're here. Well, thank you all. Thank you.